Okay. So, part one, network effects. That's a DAO, very common type of sailing boat. They were invented in Arabia, and now they've spread to Arabia and the Indian Ocean. And in fact, this DAO is a fishing boat from the Indian state of Kerala, which is in the southern part of India, faces onto the Indian Ocean. And for thousands of years, the fishermen have been taking their boats out to sea, and they're lowering their nets, they're praying, they get a good catch, they raise their nets, they bring their fish in, and they start to head to port. Now, the coast of Kerala is dotted with ports, and every one of these ports has a fish market. And the fishermen have basically, for the last few thousand years, been flipping a coin to figure out which market they're going to go to to sell their fish. And if they make a wrong decision, half another, half a dozen other boats will have pulled into the same market, and the market's going to be overloaded with fish. And the fish won't last, and the fishermen are not going to recover their costs for fishing. Meanwhile, there's going to be another market, which is like a mile away, which is not going to have any fish in it at any price, because no one bothered to pull into the market that day. That's the way it's been in Kerala for a thousand years. But over the last 24 months, India's telecoms companies, and India is the second fastest growing telecoms market in the world right now behind China, they've strung GSM towers along the Kerala coast. And because it's a coastline, GSM signals reach 25 kilometers offshore. Now, at some point, even though mobile handsets like that one, that's the Nokia 1100, that came out in 2003. It is designed to be rugged and inexpensive, and in four years, Nokia has sold 200 million of them, all right? That's double the number of iPods Apple has sold in half the time, all right? That handset is still, if you're a Kerala fisherman, going to cost you a month's wages. It's not cheap. But you know, some fishermen are maybe richer than others. Maybe they have a few boats. At some point, one fisherman bought one, brought it out to sea with him, and maybe he was just making a call ashore, talking to the family, talking to a friend, whatever. And maybe this friend happened to say to him, you know, there are no boats in here today. You probably could make a ton if you filled in the market. And all of a sudden, well, the boat pulls in, he sells all his cash, there's no competition, and well, fishermen talk to each other, and before you know it, every fisherman in Kerala has a mobile phone. And they form their own arbitrage network. And they have people they call in various ports, and market makers and fishmongers now have their own phones, and they're all creating their own markets. And so now, the markets in Kerala all have just about enough fish day to day the markets are happy, the fishermen are happy, and the fishermen are now earning more money, so much more money that the cost of a handset, which is one month's earnings, is now recouped in two months. And that's not the only example. You now have farmers in Kenya who are calling ahead to markets to find out which markets get the best price for corn, or the best price for maize, or the best price for onions. And you have Again, spice traders in Kerala were using SMS to create their own bourse as they're trading on the values of goods. Now, the interesting thing here is that although we see the mobile phone as a bling item, an item that we use in the affluent West, it turns out that whenever you give poor people mobile phones, they use them to make more money. And this has become an extremely noticed trend in the developing world. So much so that Grameen Bank, which is the original microfinance bank in Pakistan, found out that they were making a lot of their loans to people who could buy their own handsets, so they started their own mobile phone company in Bangladesh. And it turns out that a lot of the money that's being loaned in microfinance, not just in Bangladesh, but in India and Pakistan and Africa and South America, is actually being poured into mobile telephony because the correlation and there are now a series of academic papers that are being written about this. The correlation between having access to mobile human communications and being able to earn more money is now becoming strongly identified. So rather than these things being very sort of, you know, accessories, things that you don't really need, in fact, as we've seen, they're actually now essential to helping people earn a living, even in very poor parts of the world. Now, all of these relationships that we're seeing between people helping themselves in mobile communications, not a single one of them, 
not one of them was predicted by anyone anywhere. This is a very important point, all right? It means that when you deploy the network, you do not know how it's going to be used. Because the intelligence in the network is not in the routers, it's not in the towers, it's not in the handsets. The intelligence of the network is in what happens to the people once they get connected together. And we can see this because people are very resourceful and they're always going to find a way to leverage their communications to make themselves more successful. And it's interesting because carriers walk around with the idea that offering services are the way to make money, to make the consumers happy, everything. And in fact, the only service offering that's ever been successful in mobile communications, there's only one of them. What is it? SMS. Why? Because what does it do? It connects people together. The lesson there is that the most important thing, in fact, the only important thing that the network can do is to connect people together. What's the killer app of the internet still, 40 years later? Email. That's right. Okay. Why? Because it connects people together. Now, of course, we know that if you're under 16, you don't use email, but you use SMS. If you're over 20, you use email. Maybe you don't use SMS as much, but it's the same thing. They're the same thing, but in two different media. Now, here's the thing. Yes, this network in Kerala was brought into place because people had mobile handsets, towers, routers, and all that crazy stuff. But let's just use a little thought experiment here. Let's say that that entire network just sort of went away permanently. Let's say every Indian telco went bankrupt. No one was there to restart the towers. What do you suppose what happened? you think the Kerala fishermen would just go back to the way it was? Their sort of disorganized, chaotic network? Or do you suppose they might figure out that they could send smoke signals or mirrors on the beach or semaphores? Some sort of system to let them know where they should be going? This is the point. Once a network is created, it cannot be destroyed because the network is not made out of the technology. It is made out of the connection between the people. So, although we like to persistently believe that you know, there's a lot of magic in the network, that's not what the story is about. Magic is not in the network. The magic is in the people who use the network. And this is an important point because any service offering that any carrier offers through a network that isn't about connecting people together is inevitably, whether in the short term or in the long term, going to fail. Okay, I give you the examples of CompuServe, Prodigy, and AOL, bing, bang, boom, which each provided their own wall garden of services to customers and each eventually was overrun just by the stampede of people wanting to connect with each other on the internet. And that's because, at the end of the day, the people are the service providers. And I think this is, should be an essential organizing principle for every telco in the world. That's the key thing. And I hope that this gives you all pause because there's, it was brought up briefly, but there's this common understanding that the IP next generation build out is going to be a platform for IPTV. That is the big money making thing that Telstra is banking on here. And it's time for us to take a look at that promise with our new understanding about what the really important points of networks are. Because that promise is under disruption from two different directions. We're going to cover these separately. The first of these is the production of user generated or peer produced content. And the second is a disruptive collapse in the price of networking. And that networking collapse and disruption is going to allow individuals, consumers, to build their own networks.